Okay, thank you very much. First, because it was very stimulating your um, your presentation, I would comment of like share one of, of my my thoughts during the presentation, and I will refer, refer first to something that I think that um, you clearly explain, and it has great impacts in the way we think about capitalism and. Um, even more for the critical theories in capitalism. So I would say, like, first, I really appreciate this kind of understanding what is happening with these big uh, tech companies. And it's not from the perspective of global value change, chains, but it's a broader perspective, like a network uh, perspective, a more systemic approach. And I think that this is incredible, incredibly valuable because Every time I see analysis from global value chains perspective, I feel that like there is something missing, something missing. So it's very, um, it makes me happy to see that there is people uh, taking this seriously in that way, this, this kind of perspective. Uh, the second thing is that you mentioned, uh, or what I can see is that this, um, this phenomenon of depreciation, depre like, never-ending depreciation of their core assets that these big tech companies have, it's like the, the key to understand what is happening. And I think that uh, it has to do with time, it ha like with other like, I don't know, complexities, but um, so, so for me, the a question arises, so what is then depreciating so we have this kind of stagnation. And I can see that there is a sort of contradiction between the tangible assets they accumulate or the tangible assets can, that can be produced in capitalism, for example, uh, because of the ecological limits to growth. And then this um, never ending uh, or this never stopping depreciation of their core assets that uh, leads to monopoly and has the feedback. Back effects. So I would ask you, how do you see this, uh, this relationship or this role of depreciation uh, in the, like, in, in the place it takes in the heterodox models, for example? And it has to do with innovation, etc. And the other thing is uh, what, um, What would you advise to a middle or low-income country that wants to kickstart um, a developing process um, about or regarding uh, research and development, taking into account what you have presented? Take, uh, two or three yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I also just wanted to thank you first of all a lot for this amazing talk. It was really, really inspiring and especially like the holistic approach and uh, and also your comments now at the end, contextualizing it in the discipline. I just loved it. <laughs> so, um, and I, I basically wanted to ask you to expand on your comments on pharmaceuticals industry, if you can. Um, because you raised it a number of times, but you didn't go into it, and I was wondering how to, like, to what degree there's even an overlap with the, um, um, with the processes that you can that you've been describing um, for the non, um, yeah, intangible um, monopolies and the, the process of data collection and how this pays in, into in the creation of monopolies. Um, and maybe how it, the in, that might be a point of intersection, so to say that like nowadays our smartphones are registering so much of our health, health data as well and how this is like, and this is data that the pharmaceutical industry is also using to build their monopolies further mm -hmm. and how this intersection might, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. I do feel that I have a thousand questions that I would <laughs> like to ask here, <laughs> and maybe 90% of them relate to China, but I would not. <laughs> I swear, I will 
talk <laughs> about China concerning other developing countries as well. Okay. Just that um, when we're talking about the rise of China and how exactly does China actually represent an alternative or actually an alternative way of integrating within uh, international monopoly capitalism, um, there is one thing that for me it's, it's quite interesting to see, the idea that in the end when you finish your, your paper, the second one, the recap in Lundweil, um, understanding that the way that China engages with this uh, corporate uh, systems of innovation is extremely different. And this has a lot to do with the idea that um, the state has a different role in that system of innovation. And for me, I would just like to ask, what exactly are we talking about when we mean the state? Because we know that from uh, also your explanation, maybe the presentation from Kamawa and Ted, that we cannot replicate, maybe we not even want to replicate the experience of the state. But for when we're talking about the role of the state, and for me that's clearly in the literature of national systems of innovation. But we're now talking about national systems, we're talking about corporate ones. So my question for you is maybe, how can we understand the role of states, especially global south states, who are already facing external restrictions, already facing a lot of peripheral constraints that to their national development, how can they actually be part of this system of innovation, which is a corporate one, but could also be related to the national development of strategy? So maybe it's an it's a open question. But yeah, thanks. Okay, um, again, I always risk speaking too much and I really don't want to do it. So, but again, uh, really amazing questions. <laughs> okay, so I, um, I will just say a couple of things. So in terms of stagnation and where it comes from, so innovation, what basically allows is to develop productive forces. So therefore to produce the same thing with less amount of time. But that assumes that the innovation is being deployed in the whole industry. If that is kept only by some, that's the first way of looking at how that will not result in economic growth. The other way to look at it is when you access to knowledge, as the whole society accesses knowledge, there are way more people and organizations that can further develop new knowledge on that basis. Whereas if that is kept only within the realms of a corporate innovation system and the company only gives access to certain things to one university, other things to another university, other things to a startup. So not even all the actors participating in the corporate innovation system ha have access to all the knowledge. And this is said in many interviews also, people that receive funding from, let's say, Amazon, and they say, yeah, well, no, we had access to that or that, but then no, the data, of course not, that, of course not. So it's not that by even working with these companies, they get access to all the knowledge. So it's just a matter of recognizing, although it's counterfactual, that just if more people, if more organizations have access to the last developments in one field, the chances to keep developing new things and therefore innovating more and therefore growing more eventually will be higher. And that's why when I was answering the question about stagnation, I said it's not just as simple as say, okay, we are going down as a society, we're not growing. It's what could be happening given the technologies that are being developed, whereas what's actually happening. So that's why it's also complicated to show it. And just to say one word about that that I forgot also uh, before, many of the researchers that I've been working with are and, and some of them in different ways, not, not publishing yet, but we are trying to put together um, a European Commission project on intellectual monopoly capitalism that focuses on the macroeconomics, that focuses on the stagnation question, or, I mean that, that tackles many of the things that we know we haven't developed and that need to be developed. So just to, to say that it's not that we don't care at all. Uh, what, and then I will put together two questions about the role of the state and middle and low income countries. And I will say a word, some words of China. So the case of China, although it has a lot of specificities, I would say first, I would never recommend any country in the world to follow China's recipe. First, it would entail destroying all labor, the, labor, the existing labor rights. I would never recommend a Latin American country. Most of them have a lot of history of building their unions, and I would never recommend to destroy those um, uh, like historically built rights and accept lower wages so that the state can collect money and then with that money fund other things. 
The second thing to say is that China was unique not only, as you were saying, guys, because it has a huge population. So it could afford saying we are not letting the big tech companies enter because we are still building a lot of big data in-house and our companies can learn from that data in-house. The original strategy of China was to accept multinational corporations ent entering China as far as they transfer technology to, to Chinese companies, in particular to state-owned enterprises, and that failed. When we see the whole picture and we see, okay, China accepted multinational corporations, require technology transfer, and the state was very powerful, and now look at China, it's super powerful. And we skip what happened in between. In between, what happened was that those companies were not transferring technology, but that the state was powerful enough to say, this is not the way, and we need to put a lot of money, money that they were uh, in part collecting, thanks to the Chinese people, that were working under very awful conditions during decades, and put part of that money choosing sectors, because China, if you look at all the other industries that are not related to digital, is not such an hegemonic power. It's digital, it's finance, it's construction to some extent, and that's it. So it was a conscious decision, a conscious planned decision of the state to focus on certain technologies, to focus on certain industries, as much as it was the decision of the US. So I don't see, I, I don't know why you get that impression from the paper with Lundbal. Perhaps Lundbal is, uh, we do not fully agree on that, but, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, although the story is different, it's overall it's the same story. A powerful state contributing to develop its intellectual monopolies in different ways, with different strategies. Because one, because the US was the hegemonic power and China needed to protect itself from the hegemonic power. So on one side we see clear protectionism and not and, and a disrespect of the TRIPS agreement, a disrespect but once China became the power hegemonic uh, country that it is now, it started complying with TRIPS agreement, it started accepting World Trade Organization rules. So it was a conscious decision to become what China is today, including the development of its intellectual monopolies. And think about the way China is controlling its intellectual monopolies. It's not taxing them, it's asking them to donate money. So it's still asking them to replace the state functions. Instead of taxing and saying, then the state in a democratic way, of course we know states internally usually don't work like that, but the fiction of the state is that it's a more democratic way of deciding what to do with the money that is collected, for instance, through taxing. Instead of taxing, what it's saying is we need to, have, uh, we need to share the wealth that we are getting and this prosperous way of living needs to be uh, more equal and therefore big tech companies and their uh, Found their, their founders are donating money, but they are choosing what, where they are donati donating this money. And this philanthropy is not exclusive of China. Think of Bill Gates, and I could keep saying way more things, but this leads me to pharma, because the friend Bill Gates is everywhere, also influencing what happens with pharma, because he's one of the main responsibles of why the AstraZeneca vaccine and ended up being AstraZeneca vaccine when actually the developments were done by the University of Oxford. But Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations fund a lot of the research of Oxford University and although the researchers originally wanted to make that vaccine either uh, sold at a very low price or just freely distributed, the decision was that it was going to be exclusively uh, for AstraZeneca to conduct the trials and then sell the vaccine. And this uh, is just one example of how intellectual monopolies work, and moving to pharma, indeed. And that's why in the beginning I was not speaking about tech, and part of my research comes originally from pharma, because big pharma companies are another paradigmatic example of intellectual monopolies. And they also organize corporate innovation systems, they have outsourced most of the research and development, and they are harvesting all the profits. And the vaccine made, the different vaccines, made this so clear. The uh, Oxford vaccine was like 96 or 97 percent funded with public money and it's given private profits in the midst of a pandemic. We are still discussing a patent waiver in TRIPS. When will that come? AstraZeneca already said that uh, it doesn't consider that we are in a pandemic anymore. Therefore, it's going to start raising prices. So for sure, big pharma should be analyzed like that and indeed, big pharma, that's why in the digital capitalism geographies I was showing you 
Big Pharma as a, another example of enterprises that are more reliant on data. They, uh, just one example, when uh, the Israeli government did an agreement with Pfizer for the vaccine, the agreement included that the Israeli government was going to give all the data of its citizens being vaccinated and their reactions and so on to Pfizer. So really we are in a context where many more companies from different sectors are trying to become data driven. So the, ex the urgency and the gravity, the, the seriousness of what I'm describing goes way beyond uh, big tech. And I think I pretty much covered everything so I will stop here again. What I wanted to say is basically similar to what you just touched upon. Um, that difference between when it comes to IP in the pharma, big pharma industry, and when it comes to IP in the tech industry. I think in the tech industry, basically it's just a means to an end. Because I mean, the type of monopolies that uh, companies like Amazon are trying to reach kind of reminds me more of like the classical monopoly of like the Rockefeller times, where you have just such an important position in like an economy, more importantly in an infrastructure of how a society works. In the case of Amazon, that would just be retail in general. Um, that the IP is just like a tool to ensure that you are securely in that position, in that society where you have this monop like almost like a gate, uh, gatekeeper is not really the right word, but like such an important position in a, in a, in a critical infrastructure position in a society that basically the society can't work without you anymore and that of course gives a company a lot of power this is why regulation doesn't work um, yeah and I like I wanted to s do you think that that also is like an important difference between the two Um, thank you very much for your inspiring uh, talk. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask a very open and difficult question, but first of all, thank you also because last uh, weeks, like in the joint seminars we have, um, we always end up with this sensation that we really need to change things in a lot of perspective, and we kind of feel like we are the ones who has the answer, and it was very <laughs> nice to hear that we don't have the answer. But maybe it's about more the, the seniors, but not the genius. So it's not an individual idea, but try to create a community um, for creating these ideas. Uh, but I really like when you said that we need a plan, because a plan has been made of within, within the ones who has the power right now and are using the tools. And we know how to use the tools. We just need to um, embrace them somehow in this community creative sense. So my question will be like, how do you imagine like this uh, planning could be made beyond a market or a nationalist um, approach as we need to really fight these forces in a more international way? So what, what kind of, I don't know, organization or activism and not only from the Hela Tribuna um, idea? Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm not super well read in all things digital, uh, but the way that I understand it, um, we speak about a black box uh, earlier. And to my understanding, it's also a bit of a black box in terms of these tech giants, uh, where their revenue actually comes from specifically, right? And so in terms of trying to shine a light on the bandit and not look at its shadow, I, I wonder about the role of uh, reporting requirements uh, for tech giants. Okay, I think this is one of the ways that we can regulate uh, because you can't regulate what you don't measure, right, or specifically. So what is your vision of this and its ability to temper uh, predation? Thanks. Okay. Um, again, thanks a lot for the questions. I would say that IP indeed has different roles according to different types of intellectual monopolies. In the pharma industry, it's essential because you can always do reverse engineering and you've seen that like everywhere. That's partly why these companies were so uh, 
uh, so anxious and were pushing so much for the TRIPS agreement because developing countries were doing reverse engineering and the biosimilars are basically a way to try to use reverse engineering to create a slightly different molecule and still treat the same thing. So I, intellectual property rights are way more important for some sectors, pharma in particular, and we've seen this with the pandemic. In the case of tech, as I was showing, secrecy is way more important. And that's why it connects with the idea of the black, the black box and the fact that we are seeing a lot of intangibles that we were not even aware of before. And this is also why in some papers they just measure, and this is going back to, the, to your issue about the problems of measuring, there's a paper. I like very much the colleague and we exchange things quite often and he's quite nice, but he uh, has just published a paper saying, oh, oh um, finally the tech giants are not so intensive in intangibles because they are super intensive in, intensive in tangibles and their intangible assets are not a, such an important share of their total assets. And it was like, dude, even the neoclassical economies are saying that we're measuring, we do not measure data, they harvest data for free, there is no way for measuring the data that has been harvested, they undervalue all their intellectual property right, all the algorithms that are kept secret, Who know, don't, they don't even know actually how to value it probably. So of course they are undervaluing and they are, are so intensive in tangible assets because they have all those intangibles that need to be kept somewhere and to flow around. So. Overall, we are indeed, we lack a lot of new indicators and we are working on it. No, I don't know what, what I mean, we are, we are aware of that with colleagues working on this topic and we are trying to find indicators to try to show data concentration. Uh, we are trying to proxy this, going back to the discussion about the material things you were saying. Behind data, behind algorithms, we have labor and that is something that is easier to measure. So we are trying to use uh, data from uh, global databases from that try to provide information about labor to proxy data concentration. And uh, we'll see how it goes, because of course, again, we go back to the problems of statistics and that most of them are being elaborated at the national level and we want to analyze, analyze global problems. Therefore, we will need to rely on uh, private databases on labor, LinkedIn, basically. So we need to rely on Microsoft for this. But still, we need new indicators. Indeed, annual reports are very ill-equipped. Still, there are things that can be done. We still need to look at annual reports. But of course, that needs to be changed. But while that doesn't happen, as researchers, we need to try to find new and alternative ways to provide evidence of what's going on. I'm using publications and patents because that is what was available for me. It's not that I think that those are the most relevant outputs to analyze intellectual monopolies. I wanted to have a global scope and at the level of the organization. There was nothing else left. So that's why we're also thinking about other things uh, in that relation. And uh, on the question about how, well, I will tell you in a week what I can think of because I need to write a thing for Jacob in Latin America precisely about that about planning in the age of algorithms and what can be done differently, and I haven't thought much about it. But I can tell you one thing uh, that I've been considering, the, or different, different things. The first is that we need to rethink about unions. Unions are mostly nowadays being organized at the level of the industry and within a country. And production is organized at the global level and crossing different industries in subsystems of production. So we need to rethink even of the institutions that were originally born to counterbalance capitalism, to get something back to workers. It's, not, it's even defensive in one way, but even unions are ill-equipped. Another thing is the type of skills that we need to develop. And we may like this more or less, but we need to be friends with technology. Technology in itself uh, all is never neutral. But it's up to us how, what we prioritize, the type of things, the type of science we develop, the type of technologies we develop, and how we use it. The decisions on what, nowadays on what type of AI is being developed are being made by tech giants. Even the startup companies and with all the, um, this, uh, this very fantasy world that is built around them, 
they're the, they get money that they are funded by either tech giants or venture capitals that, have, that are very concentrated. Another thing that I've been looking at is data from the funding sources that uh, startups from different tech sectors uh, receive. And that's very concentrated, even in the cryptocurrencies sector, where we are supposed to be witnessing uh, some form of uh, emergence of a more equal community and all these um, terms that are constantly used to say that it's, it doesn't need to rely on any external form of hierarchy and they're all equal. And when you see who's funding this industry, it's highly concentrated. Therefore, again, hierarchies constantly emerge in capitalism. So we need to understand that but in all, and to think about alternatives. And to do that, we need also to have our own research agendas. So that's another thing that can be done from now onwards. My research agenda, of course, it's related to my personal interest, but at the same time, my research agenda is deeply political. And there is no researcher that is objective. That doesn't exist, because doing research is an activity. So we are always involved in doing that. It's work, it's labor. So as much as someone put labor in this, I'm putting labor in my paper. So I cannot be exempted for the, from the paper. I'm always part of the paper. And what I'm saying in the paper is the result of where I did my undergrad, where I studied after that, the type of things that I'm reading, the type of people I'm connecting. There is no way we can detach from that. There is no way we can detach from that when we teach. The most honest thing is to say it out loud and explicitly. And those that say that science is objective, they do not even understand the process of producing knowledge because it's a production process. And, it's, and by being a production process, it's part of our subject matter. It's part of what we should be studying as economists. So another thing, one word, is hackers. Those guys, I mean, we need hackers. We need good hackers. Because they know a lot of things. And we cannot all become experts. We can embrace technology, think about different ways. But I think that hackers will have a, a big role to play in the near future. Yes? But I think hackers alone also are not enough. We of course need, not. Of course not. People who translate the knowledge, like we need whistleblowers. As well. As well. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Cecilia. <laughs> no, and thanks to all of you. It's been great and a pleasure.